This is commercial and residential investments sorted. So the session's about property as an investment, and in particular, multifamily housing in the USA and commercial offices as an asset class in Australia and why each one of them is important. We've got two expert speakers to help us navigate this territory this afternoon. Our first speaker, and you can read their bios in your app, so I'm not going to read their extensive and impressive bios to you this afternoon, but our first speaker is Tanya Lambert, who's the Asset Manager for Asset Investment Managers in Real Assets. And Tanya's going to talk to us about commercial investments. And her, she, Tanya notes that there has been a shift in attitude to investment in commercial property from being a passive asset to appreciating the value that can be added by returns to returns by active management of these investments. And I think I'm really looking forward to hearing what Tanya says, particularly in light of what Rufus Black had to say at lunchtime about our stewardship of these types of investments. When I chair these kinds of sessions, I always ask the speakers if they can share one or two of their secret superpowers so that you can get to know them a little bit better. And Tanya's secret superpower, because she's a busy mum with a couple of children, is that she's expert at using the mute button on teleconference calls. She's probably been known to be in all kinds of interesting places when those calls have been taking place with all kinds of yelling young children in the background. So Tanya, I ha have to hand it to you that you managed to work and have two loud children as well. Our second speaker is Jay Martha, who's come to us all the way from America, and welcome. First time in Australia, apparently, so hopefully not the last. Um, Jay is the Managing Director, the Head of Housing Sector from Nuveen in the USA, and I'm looking forward to Jay's insights into the US multifamily housing sector with a focus on middle income earners, middle income households and millennials. And as a parent of three 20 something year old children who seem to love living at home, any tips about moving them out of my house would be really greatly appreciated, Jay. Um, Jay has two really interesting su secret superpowers. The first one is that he has run a marathon every year for the last 37 years, which is just amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. And the second secret superpower, which he tells me is in the past, although I'm not sure, is that he can drink a beer while he's standing on his head. So if any of you have been scheduled to have a beer with James tonight, it might be more interesting than you thought. <laughs> so without further ado, I will hand over and welcome to the stage Tanya Lambert. Thank you. Oh. Before I do that, you've got a job to do, which is to answer a question. Sorry, I'm hopeless at reading instructions. There is a, there is a poll for you to have a look at, so it would be great if, while Tanya's speaking to us, you could answer that question and we'll have a quick look at it. Thank you. Thanks. Talk about the answers to that. No, I haven't seen that before. What is that? It's just a question that they're asking. What level of exposure does yeah. your... Oh. oh, well, we'll do it. We'll do it. My time has started. Thank you. So returns from real estate allocation will doubtless be a topic of conversation over the course of this conference. In a low return environment, investors are searching for yield. Real estate has consistently delivered this. AXA Investment Manager's view, our house view, is that Australian real estate offers, despite moderating capital growth, which should continue to produce an attractive yield and total return when compared to other global markets. Today I'm here to talk about the office sector and the changes that are occurring within this sector that you as investors may need to be aware of. Changes that you need to understand, embrace and price when you're making asset allocation decisions. To offer context, the office market within Australia is approximately 25 million square metres, roughly the same size as the London office market. But what it may lack in size, it does offer the, one of the most liquid markets in the world, offering investors the opportunity to participate efficiently and actively. But the office sector is changing and we need to understand these changes and respond to them. The landscape, in terms of tenant expectations, has shifted dramatically, and I'll show you a number of case studies later that indicate how this is affecting our asset management. So as the super funds in the room, you may well have up to half of your domestic property allocation in real estate, in, particularly in office. So as large owners and investors in this category, or is it this investment class, you need to understand these changes that are occurring and how you should adapt to them. And to do this, you need to be brave and you need to innovate. I'm going to show you some case studies that 
um, show you how we are re reacting to these changes with strategies that we're adopting at the asset level to protect returns and future-proof the assets. Whilst a number of these examples, the case studies may well be in um, premium grade assets, the important thing to note is that they're all scalable and a watered down version of these strategies can be applied to any asset class. These strategies will protect income, income returns and capital values and demonstrate to you that office should still be a valid and meaningful part of your portfolio. Okay, so we're gonna set the scene here. Who remembers offices that may have looked like this? You may have even had the misfortune to work in offices that look like this. But the key takeaway from these images, and not the fact that the dude on the right is smoking at his desk, which is hilarious, but it's the fact that if we look at those workstations, they're, they're identical. It assumes that every employee, every worker's needs, wants, motivations are exactly the same. Thankfully today, office design is a little more thoughtful. It's human-centric and embeds a number of finishes that you might find in your own home and appeals, therefore, to a wide variety of users. It's biophilic by design, and what we mean by that is it embeds a closer connection to nature. That might be through natural light, through landscaping, planting, um, or ventilation. We know that these elements encourage a more productive and healthy workforce. But whilst office has traditionally been a fairly passive investment. You really, you're buying an income stream, it's relatively low risk, you just needed to keep the lights on and you're good. This has shifted dramatically in recent years. And the reason for this change is these people, millennials, those born between 1981 and 1986. They want wellness, they want culture, and they value those kind of um, facets from their working life above salary. They're ambitious, career orientated, confident, and their influence on the workspace has a significant impact on the way organizations consider their real estate needs and their office requirements. So we need to understand them and we need to understand what they want. This is in the context of the fact that 65% of today's primary school students will be in jobs that don't exist yet, which I say this stat a lot and it still blows my mind that having young children. But I think it's also exciting as well. Um, and, but we do need to understand in, when we're playing in a relatively static asset class, we're talking bricks and mortar here, how do we try and understand what that might mean for us in terms of the amenity that we need to offer to attract and retain the tenants of today and the future? Well, this is how we respond. And these three words I really want you to remember because they're particularly critical. We thread these three things through the, the whole of our service offering. Amenity. Now when I talk about that, and I'll give you some coal face examples in the slides to follow, what I really mean is delivering amenity into your commercial assets that gives your occupiers everything that they would expect from their home life. And if we think about how we choose where we live, how we choose where we might buy our homes, yes, price and location, probably important, but it's normally a raft of other factors too that are sometimes intangible. You just, you know you want to be in that area. The community around you is the kind of people that you, you like or you aspire to. Um, perhaps the schools are great, perhaps there's a great transport outside, whatever it might be. There's a whole raft of reasons why you choose it. And really what we're recognizing is that the way tenants choose their office buildings is no different. So we, it's not enough to be market priced and in a good location. I mean, we're talking about CBD assets, they're all in a relatively good location. We have to deliver a whole lot more. Technology, this is probably the hardest part. I won't even pretend that it's not. Property is probably the last major industry to be disrupted by technology. And I can't help thinking at last, the way that we've managed office buildings in particular has hardly changed for decades. So this is a welcome change, but it's, it's, it's rapid and it's extremely disruptive right now as landlords to understand how we respond to this and what technology we choose and how we embed it. It must be useful, it must be intuitive. With the millennials in particular, you don't get a second chance. You deliver an app for them, and on the first day, it doesn't really do what they thought it would, that's it, your chance is gone. So this is one of our biggest challenges. And finally, the human experience. Threading hospitality through our whole service offer is critical. Seeing space as a service, that's a phrase that we use a lot in the industry, that's, it's very important to understand and believe in that, and embed that through our whole service offering. 
and I'll show you examples of what we mean. So now we're on to our case studies. Um, QV1 in Perth, that's a premium grade asset in what has been a very challenging market. And what we tried to do there was really think about what we could deliver for our tenants, for our occupiers, to give them an experience so they couldn't get somewhere else. That you know, intangible, makes you feel good kind of amenity that is the extra hook to keep them there. And this illustrates three examples of the strategies that we implemented. Some of them are really apparent what they are, some of them are not. So I'll start with the one in the middle, which is probably the easier one. That's actually my general manager, Paul Tarachi, God love him, with one of his chickens. So what this is about is we had a vacant um, roof space, and we thought, okay, we could do something with this. This is it's accessible, the tenants can get up there, what can we create? So we decided to create a community garden. My fund manager thought I was a bit insane, but given it was only about 20k capital expenditure, he was like, okay, have a go. And that's probably one of the key messages, is a lot of what we're doing, there may not be a proven business case for this, you've got to have a go, you've got to be brave. So the general manager, he was fully on board with this and happy to help create it, and we created um, a number of plots that each of the t major tenants can tend. Um, they come down at lunchtime, they, they tend their vegetables, they get to grow their own produce, take it home. We've got chickens, which Paul, our general manager, absolutely loves them, comes to make sure they're okay every weekend. And we've got bees producing honey, which is not as simple as it sounds. I thought it was easy. I thought you just get bees and you get a hive and you get honey, but no. We lost three queen bees, I think, in the early days because they need to be perfectly happy, otherwise they just leave. So we've got them going now, and luckily we had a beekeeper amongst our tenants, so she came down and helped us figure this whole schmuzzle out, and now we're producing QB1 honey. The image on the left, another underutilized area, we developed a rooftop cinema. So rooftop cinema is, who doesn't love to go and sit on a beanbag and watch a movie? That seems like a great idea. Um, it's free for the tenants, so who doesn't like free stuff? And this, we have a whole summer program now, and the tenants have really embraced that. The one on the right is something that I've, I really like, this idea. I need to try and do it somewhere else. But we had a vacant tenancy in our retail plaza, and it was pretty kind of just boarded up and a bit ugly. We had a nice picture, but there was nothing going on there. So we developed an ATM. We called it Harry, after Harry Seidler, who designed the building. I'm sure he'd be delighted to know that he's got an ATM named after him. But we had uh, all of our tenants who were on our database. We had their details. We emailed them a special ATM code, and they were able to then come down at lunchtime and put in their special code, and they got a free thing. They got, might be a coffee, might be a voucher for one of our retail tenants, which there's a dual purpose there because the retail tenants, they're like, we need customers, help us. So we're like, okay, fine, we'll send them there. So we were helping the retail tenants, and we're, the tenants themselves um, are occupiers in the building. They love that, and it's been, it was a huge success and activated the tenancy until we were able to lease it. 101 Collins Street in Melbourne. So this is an asset where I spend most of my time at the moment. We uh, delivered a new end-of-trip facility last year, in um, March last year. We, we already had an end-of-trip facility, and for the avoidance of doubt, I'm talking about showers, lockers, um, bike stores, that thing that's normally in the basement. And it's normally fairly pedestrian by nature, and you definitely don't want to go in the showers without your thongs on kind of joint. But this, we saw the opportunity to deliver something that would be a lot more um, user-friendly, much, I guess, spoiling our tenants. And really, it, it, it isn't that hard. We, we had vacant car spaces, car spaces, are, you know, re rent from car spaces that's going to dwindle. So we need to be repurposing those kind of areas and creating something more useful. So we managed to design a whole facility that was extremely intuitive and thoughtful by design, and those are two words I like to use a lot. And it's really not that hard. It's about getting the lighting right. It's about journeying on grade with your bike rather than in the car park battling with cars and not having to drop your bike here and take a shower there and then go somewhere else to take the lift, having that whole journey thought through. So tenants have really embraced this, and usage has gone up by 225%. So I think we can safely say that they like it and they're using it, and it's encouraging wellness in the workspace and tenants to take breaks during their day, which we think is, is critical in, today, in today's work environment. Interesting, interestingly, one of our major tenants, who will remain nameless, who elected to move to a new development, and they made that decision 
to be fair, before this was delivered, and now trying to butter up our management team to allow them to still use the facility, and perhaps they could keep their access cards and still use our end of trip when they move to their new building. So I think you can guess what we have said to them about that. You need to be still here if you want to use this. On the back of the success of that amenity, we're developing a wellness center. So wellness in the workspace, most landlords understand this, understand it's important, want to try and embed it somehow in their service offering. But you've, we've got to consistently push the bar and be braver and think of something new. So this, this is unique. When we deliver this in about November, it should be completed and open. It'll be one of the first, well, will be the first of its kind in Australia. So it's not just, oh, we've got a vacant office floor, perhaps we could get a yoga class going, which is great and admirable. I, I, I don't um, refute that for a second. But this is, uh, will be a full service studio, two, or two studios offering a variety of group exercise, targeting specifically um, men and women. We want both to group exercise, as well as chiro, osteo, um, physio. And this is, there's no business model for this. I can't talk to my fund manager and go, well, they've done it over there and we know it works. We don't know that, but we do co-create and collaborate with our tenants when we build stuff like this. So we know that they've told us they want it and they'll use it, and that sufficiently reduces the risk for me to get approval to go ahead with this. Clicker. Okay. Other strategies, digitization of your buildings. Like I mentioned earlier, the commercial office world hasn't changed significantly in terms of how we've managed these buildings for decades. Linking everything together, getting it online, harvesting, mining data, that is absolutely critical in terms of understanding how we can deliver efficiencies and a better experience for our tenants who live in these buildings. Just for example, um, we might be capital planning to replace end-of-life plant, but if you've got that plant online and you can actually see that it hasn't broken down for two years, so it might be end-of-life, but I can push out that expenditure for two years, that's extremely valuable. Third spaces. What we mean by that is your first space is your home, your second space is your work, your third space is other spaces that you might want to use for work, and we need to provide these within the workspace. It could be co-working, that's a popular one. Um, Working out how much of our space we turn over to co-working is a challenge because these organizations who, who operate co-working have not been tested in the downturn. But what we do know is our tenants want flexible space. They can't see in the current environment five to ten years in advance. So they can't commit to a 20-year lease or a 10-year lease. They want to say to me, well, 80% of my space, I'll take it in, traditional lease, in a traditional lease. 20% I need it in flexible co-working project space and you need to provide that. So we need to respond. In the future, the two polar opposite of opposite ends of the spectrum strategies here. The image of the lounge room there, that's indicative of a, a member's lounge that we're trying to create at 101 Collins Street, which is playing purely to the C-suite. It'll be invitation only, we'll deliver curated really meaningful um, experiences for the members that are useful to them, and um, it'll be another hook to keep them in the building. If we deliver this, and it really adds value, it creates connections with their, other, with their peers within the building, then it, it'll be yet another amenity that it's really hard for them to leave behind, because you can only be a member and have access to this if you're a tenant at 101. On the other end of the spectrum, social enterprise. So this, this, we're partnering at the moment with a social enterprise in Melbourne that has particularly resonated with me personally. And it's, it's easy to get um, excited about some of this. When you go and meet this particular social enterprise and they, they help disadvantaged youth get back into the workspace, you find yourself thinking, I really want to try and help these people somehow. How can we, how can we you know, help them with their journey? The interesting thing about this particular social enterprise that we're working with is that our tenants already support this particular enterprise. So this doesn't have to be that hard. Just find out what it is that's important to your tenants. And when we're talking about millennials, these are people who want to give back. They want to make the world a better place, which it makes, it, it makes you feel good to be able to give back. So it's, it's in some ways a no-brainer to try and incorporate this into your service offering. So we really want these people to be able to, um, we give them a foothold in the building, they'll operate a food and beverage operation, they'll also set up a community garden that we know has been successful elsewhere, giving tenants the opportunity to engage with that and have cooking classes or tend the garden and help this tenant because all of the help they give them goes straight back to the disadvantaged youth that we're trying to help. 
So there's two completely different examples there, I suppose, of how we can, we can try and offer something different. And that's the critical message is be brave, whatever you can think of. You know, it's, it's, I saw a Grosvenor place in Sydney the other day. They had, um, they had a cuddle, an alpaca, or maybe a llama, whichever ones are the friendly ones of the two, that you could go and cuddle them. And the queue in their plaza was like wrapped around three times. Like, who doesn't like that stuff? It's, it, just think of it and deliver it, and you'll find that your tenants will really enjoy it, giving them a better day in the office. So, in conclusion, office is still a very attractive investment class, but we are in a very, very dynamic and rapidly shifting environment. The structural shift in tenant expectations requires brave, active, and innovative asset management to protect your returns. But just because the world of work is changing, that doesn't mean that the landlord's perspective has. Collecting rent and keeping our tenants full, retaining our customers for as long as possible is still our top priority. But by responding to that growing demand at the coalface for um, flexible working conditions, flexible working options in your assets, and delivering a tailored, curated, and useful experience for them means you'll protect your income returns and attract and retain the tenants of today and tomorrow. Thank you very much for listening. now? Or is that too hard? It's up to you. Ah, excellent. We've, we have got it up, I think. There it is. Award for the worst chair of a session so far in this conference, and you're going to be going to do better than me. So there's the answers to the questions. Thanks for the suggestion, James. So 56% of you have in excess of 10% of your exposure, the exposure of your fund is into property. And interestingly, a couple of people have no exposure to property. So thank you for answering that question. And it just shows that for 56% of you, well, for all bar 2% of you, um, this is a topic of great interest. So now I'll hand over to James. Thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'm Jay Martha, and, and I head up um, the housing sector for Nuveen Real Estate in the US. Uh, just kind of a big picture for those of you who don't know Nuveen, Nuveen Investment Management has about a trillion dollars in assets under management. Nuveen Real Estate has about 130 billion globally, and 94 billion of that is in the US. Um, in the US, um, and, and across our platform, we believe that, that specialists will outperform a generalist. And so we design our company to align to sector specialties. So as I mentioned, I head up, head up housing in the US. There's um, approximately 20 billion in, in US housing in our, in our portfolio. And it's across the risk spectrum. So core value add, luxury workforce, student, manufactured, senior housing. Um, so what I'd like to do today is um, because I, my expectation is there's not a lot of investment in U.S. multifamily, so I'd like to talk a little bit about the U.S. multifamily market, uh, why we think multifamily in the U.S. should be considered as part of your uh, investment portfolio, and also uh, why we favor housing that meets the demands of millennials and middle incomes. So from a, a top-down perspective, uh, multifamily in the U.S. has been and continues to be a stable income-producing asset class. Uh, so some of the statistics, attractive historical returns, 8.6% return, total returns over the last 15 years on average. Uh, favorable, uh, strong demographic economic support, particularly the millennial households that are being formed today. Uh, high long-term historical occupancies. So the four major uh, product types. Um, multifamily in the US is, has the highest average occupancy over a 20 year period, averaged over 93%. Could you explain for me, and I'm not sure, what you mean by multifamily? Okay, so yeah. I'm familiar with in Australia. Oh, right, right, so it's, it, it, it's rental housing. These are housing for, for um, rental households. Uh, and in, in the U.S., uh, uh, about 36% of households are renter households. The other 64% are homeowners. So it's, in, it's group, a housing estate type? It, 
Yes, yeah. So a, t a typical property in the U.S. would be 250, 300 units that are aggregated. Every, every, it's, it's single ownership. So, yeah, my understanding a little bit is there's, there's about a million um, uh, landlords in Australia that have individual units, right? right. The, the market in the U.S. is completely different. It, it's very institutionally owned. Uh, so the large, uh, large properties, um, as I say, 250, 300 units, kind of average size, um, all rental housing, nobody buys anything there. Lease terms are typically 12 months, plus or minus. We're constantly moving people in and out. Uh, it's a very dynamic market. Yeah, you have, excuse me? These, these are all apartments, they're, they're yeah, yeah, all, all apartments. Uh, yeah, 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 thanks for the question, right? It, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, get us back to square one uh, and level set. Um, so th think of it as taking all the, all the individual rental housing and saying, okay, that's a very inefficient model and making it an institutional model. And that, that's what we have in the U.S. So most of the institutional work, when you think of households that are renter households, that are not homeowners, those, are, those renters are in institutional quality properties that have 250, 300 units, all aggregated, all renters, and then all the services are based on rentership. All right, so it's, it's community buildings, it's, it's gatherings, it's swimming pools, it's fitness centers, it's basketball courts. All that is for renters. And, and you think about it, I, I talk about this for, in markets that, that don't have housing like this. You deserve as a renter, you deserve it, you just don't even know it yet. And once you see it, you say, wow, there's a better answer there. And, and what you find as an investor is you find it's a very stable, income-producing uh, asset class. So that, yeah, so that's what we're talking about. And, and so high, very, you know, very high occupancy across, across the country, 93% average occupancy over the last 20 years. It also has the lowest capital reinvestment of the four major sectors. So office, industrial, retail, the multifamily, lowest capital reinvestment. So when we think about where we are in a cycle, you think about what you want to have in your, in your portfolio, particularly in a long cycle, income producing, stable, high occupancy with low capital reinvestment. That's what multifamily is in the US. So in, in, in a, a, from a liquidity perspective, very interesting. Last year, there's $175 billion of multifamily transactions in the US. So apartments trading hands, you, as you can see in this, in this chart, that's 34% of the total real estate market. It's the highest, it, it outstrips uh, office transaction activity, and it's almost as much as, as industrial and retail combined. So it's a huge, huge market in the U.S. So large, diverse, as I say, 36% of, of U.S. households are renter households. The market is about $2 trillion when we talk about the institutional uh, multifamily market. There's workforce housing, luxury housing, student housing, uh, senior housing. Uh, it's diversified by household incomes. So about a third of the market is lower incomes, $20,000 and below. About a third is moderate incomes, that twenty dollars to $50,000 range. And about a third of it is, is middle income to high income, so above $50,000 in annual income. You also see from, from a stock perspective, there have been apartments uh, for over 100 years. Um, you go into some of the more established markets like New York, you'll see pre-war buildings they're, they're referred to. They've been rental stock for, for 100 years. And about 50% of that stock is, is 40 years or younger. Uh, just under 20% is, has been developed in the last 20 years. There's this, uh, our, our, our research group has, has gone out and looked at the top 2% of cities uh, structural, designed for structural growth across the globe. There's 90 cities identified. 35 cities uh, of those cities are in the U.S. Um, so you can see on the map, very, very uh, geographically diverse, the, the top 35 cities in the U.S. We also bifurcate those cities between growth cities and core cities. So core cities are, are cities, you, you know, names you recognize right off the top. Boston, New York, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Miami, San Francisco, Los Angeles. These tend to be a little bit more expensive markets, but very stable uh, investment markets. 
The other uh, half of those, those top 35 in the U.S. are growth markets. Those markets tend to have a higher employment uh, component that's targeted toward technology and innovation. They also tend to be a little bit more affordable. So markets like Raleigh, North Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee has become the center of healthcare in the U.S. People don't know that, but there's been an aggregation of, of healthcare uh, offices in, in Nashville. Minneapolis, Minnesota, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, Portland, Oregon. These are, these are cities that are attracting millennials because of their exposure to tech employment and innovation. Uh, and, they're, and they're also a little bit more affordable and they're kind of cool cities as opposed to some of the core, core locations. Um, so what, what's bolstered demand? Uh, a couple of things. When we look at, at households and household formations, it's job growth. So in the US, over the last eight years, we've averaged between 150 and 200,000 job, new jobs per month very strong period of, of employment growth. And what that has set up is, is the opportunity for expanded household formations above the, the long-term um, trend line. On a supply side, a couple of things. So in this chart, you'll see the last four uh, blue bars are above the long-term trend line. So we're in a period where supply has, has outstripped the, the long-term trend line. And you'll see that it's about to peak this year in 2019. But it's important to note if you go back the 15-year period from 2001 through, let's say, 2015, there was a severe undersupply of multifamily development. And, and what, what happened is the first part of that decade, 2001 through 8, there was a, a, an overemphasis on single-family home ownership in the U.S. And so there was a lack of supply that happened. 2008 came along, the global financial crisis, the spigot of capital got turned off, no more development. So what we had is 15 years of undersupply. Now we've had four years of oversupply, which is peaking now. And, uh, but one important factor is the supply has almost all been focused on center cities in core markets, expensive markets, and high rise. So it's targeting the luxury component of the, of the overall housing demand. It's that top 20% of the renters that can afford a new supply. What it has created is an opportunity for housing that meets middle incomes because we haven't had supply for 20 years. Uh, one of the major factors, demand factors on multifamily is uh, millennials, similar to, to the future of of the office environment and, and future jobs. Millennial households are being formed today. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're saddled with, um, with student lend debt. So if you look at that bottom left chart, you'll see that over the last 10 years, the average student is graduated uh, $25,000 of debt 10 years ago. Now it's over $35,000 of debt. So very shallow balance sheets, if you will. Interestingly, across the Across the, um, the age spectrum in the U.S., since the global financial crisis, there's been an increase in, in renter households in every age cohort. However, millennials are expected to form 300,000 new households a year for uh, the next several years. And so they are a big demand driver for uh, rental households. The, the lower right-hand chart, you'll see the average uh, home ownership across the U.S. is 64, 65 percent. Um, but you see millennials, those under 35 have now dipped below 40% home ownership. Now some of that's expected, but what it basically says is those households under 35 are 60% more likely to rent than they are to own. However, uh, the economic outlook is, is pretty favorable, both for millennials and, and middle incomes. So a couple of things, uh, top left chart, GDP growth, GDP growth has been very healthy in the U.S., remains on that track. The lower right-hand side, you'll see that uh, unemployment in the U.S. is at a cyclical low, and it's actually almost at a 50-year low. So very attractive. What that does is it creates a con consumer confidence that's at, at an 18-year high. What does that lead to? Again, that, that propensity to form a household. People have jobs. They're getting money, the economy's strong, there's consumer confidence, we start to, to create households. Where are those households being created? It's in the millennial side. And what we'll find is millennials 
are not in a position to, to buy homes, they're in a position to rent. I also mentioned that uh, U.S. multifamily is, is an income producing asset class. And so I'll just describe this, this chart. Um, this is a 40 year look at multifamily, institutional multifamily returns in the U.S. So the, we have something called the NACRE Property Index, the NPI. That's the, the index that, that uh, real estate is measured against in the U.S. for institutional real estate investors. So the blue line that moves somewhere between 9% and 5% across that chart, that's the annual income return from multifamily investing across the, the institutional class. The jagged, volatile orange line, that's the total return for multifamily across, again, on an annual basis across 40 years. And what you'll see is that the annual income for multifamily in the U.S. has averaged 6.8% over 40 years, and total return has been just over 10%. And even when you look at that spike in the downturn in 2008 with the global financial crisis, the income return was still 5.5%. Again, a very stable asset class that generates income. A little bit of a, a look at the demand side, particularly on, on multifamily, and then Generation Z behind them. So we, we all talk about millennials. They're the biggest cohort in, in the U.S. history, much bigger than the, than the baby boomers. Um, they have a high propensity to rent. But what doesn't get talked about much is Generation Z right behind them are also bigger than the baby boomers and only slightly smaller than, than the millennial generation. And so what we, we see is we have a long tenure of young households that are going to be formed over the next decade plus that are going to be looking for housing. Again, rental housing in the U.S. is going to be part of that answer. Even looking at the, the chart on the right, you'll see that 62% uh, of millennials are still in their 20s. So we're in a very healthy environment for demand for, for rental housing, and we've got tailwinds with Generation Z behind us. Um, looking at middle incomes, uh, since the global financial crisis, we, we've seen this phenomenon of, of increased rental growth because there's been a movement of households from ownership households to renter households. So looking at this chart, the blue line is the annual increase in, in rental rates across the institutional asset class for multifamily. And the orange line is the increase in incomes, uh, average incomes in, in households. And what you see is, right, rent growth has outpaced income growth. And what it does, again, is it, it pinches or creates a little bit of a crisis of affordability for middle income housing. Again, so that becomes the answer. How do you satisfy the middle? This chart actually just looks a little bit at, at younger households and the fact that they don't make as much as the average household. Uh, yeah, right, not surprising. Um, but so, some of the other uh, winds, headwinds that are facing them, record high student loan, stricter lending requirements, um, the lack of a, a balance sheet for a down payment. People are going to their parents. You want to Jocelyn, you want to get rid of your children, you got to put a down payment for them. The, uh, <laughs> no, you have to get them in rental housing is what you have to do. So, and prolonged decisions to marry and start families, right? This is, it's, it's not just in the U.S., right? This is happening everywhere. But the ability to stay mobile, to rent your house, and then move where your career opportunities are, those 35 cities around the U.S., Right? If, if technology is your bag and you, and you want to get out to San Francisco, you go. If, if there's better opportunities in Austin, Texas, you move. And there's nothing that saddles you like, like a home. Right? You're able to find institutional quality apartment right near where you work. And once you're ready to settle down and start a family, you make choices from there. Um, this is an interesting slide, just a statistic that um, in our top 35 cities, what you'd, you'd think about in the expensive cities like New York and San Francisco, you'd say a high propensity to rent for middle incomes because it's very expensive. But by example, Atlanta and Dallas, which are much more affordable cities, middle incomes tends to, tend to be higher renters there as well. And it's part of it is the employment centers that are there. You can come in and, and move your career forward uh, and, and, and not be saddled to home ownership. It's, it's part of the attraction of, of renting and why we have these 35 cities identified. What, what this chart just says all of our 35 cities for middle incomes, we have, there's a 44% um, propensity to rent versus the national average of 36. Again, so picking the right cities for multifamily housing is extremely important. I'm going, to, I'm going to just take a second to, to walk you through this, this chart a little bit because 
there's, it, it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's pretty complex. But, but anyway, in, in the middle of that gray cone, you'll see that that is $72,000. So you take all 35 of our target cities in the US, right, the tomorrow's world cities, the median income is $72,000. In the US, right, uh, a standard rule of thumb, and actually HUD, Housing and Urban, Urban Development, uses this same statistic, 30% of your gross income can be used for housing. So use that, that rule of thumb, you take tomorrow cities, 35 cities, median income, household income, $72,000, take 30% of that, divide it by 12, you get $1,800, right? So, so the, the median income in the middle income household can afford a rent of $1,800. And we further define that as between 80 and 120% of median income, right? So that's, that's our middle income component. And that's what their target is to comfortably live 30% of their, their income for housing. What you see at the top of the graph, that's the supply side. So I talked about supply over the last four years. And here's what's come in. It's been luxury housing and development. If you look at the, at the, at the luxury housing, the rent is 21 70 and the the new development rents are $2,350 per month and what you, what you find is the supply didn't meet the demand right the demand is for $1,800 a month rents and that's your middle income component very very durable and the supply has come in at the top those top renters again it opens the door for filling that demand side so that that's that's part of the question so for us overall we look at it and say as you put a multifamily portfolio together, never lose sight of where your most durable demand is. That, that is that middle income, and the millennials are feeding that middle income component of the households. So we look at that and say, that's your core component. That's 75, 80% of what you should do if you invest in US multifamily. And then after that, it's the economic cycles on how you can create alpha. So today, I would say we're in that upper left-hand quadrant, right? We're in expanding market still, but it's probably late. It's probably 11 o'clock or so. Um, so uh, restore to core, season core, that's kind of a strategy that would enhance uh, what you do in your middle income housing. If we breach that and go into a recession, I think it's workforce housing and specialty housing. So an example of specialty housing would be student accommodations, senior housing. So as, as we know, right, an economy starts to drop, Education becomes an alternative to employment, and uh, there's an uptick in student demand, student accommodations fits. On the, on the other side, senior housing, we still haven't figured out how to delay aging when the economy slows. If we can figure that out, we'll make a lot of money, but uh, there's still gonna be that demand for senior housing. So finally, I guess in, in um, just in conclusion, I use the, the still looks bright. Future still looks bright in U.S. In apartments because it's been a, a very good run for U.S. apartments. Um, but, but the characteristics are, are still very strong. So we target apartments that are lower price points, right? Not the, not the brand new supply constrained markets uh, that capture the demand from expanding household formations. <clears throat> we look at the, uh, the drivers of total return, healthy U.S. economy. Demographic trends, particularly millennials that are, that are in their um, prime uh, renting years, household formation years. Uh, fundamentals that, that are, remain attractive and that, that's uh, for the most part because of very deep uh, demand. We have a very read, readily available financing in, in housing. It's probably the cheapest finance, financing of the four primary sectors um, uh, because of the stability that it has. Um, there still is a strong interest, both domestic and, and international, in, in multifamily housing. And then NOI is going to be the driver of total return. And we feel very comfortable with that demand that NOI is going to continue to grow. So uh, with that, I'll thank you for, uh, for attending. Thank you very much to both Tanya and Jay for really informative presentations. I've got some great questions here, but we're completely out of time, um, and I don't want to impede on the next session. Have we got time for one question? Yep, great. We've got time for one question. So, um, I, actually, I might ask a really quick question to each of you. So, Tanya, the future of the office, if millennials want to work at home and all that sort of stuff, what, what do you think is going to happen very briefly with the future of the office? Sure. Um, so, the, there's no question that... Mm, is this mic working? Yep. Yeah. There's no question that um, 
it is more challenging to keep people in an office five days a week. And I actually don't think that we need to even try to do that because the days of uh, measuring productivity on whether your coat's on the back of the chair, they're long gone, thank goodness. So there will always be, um, there will be a growing proportion of people wanting to work from different locations, but it's still critically important as well, for, and organisations recognise this, and I think employees do too, that they come together. So I think tenant footprints will shrink because they know they don't, we're already seeing that. They don't need to provide a desk for everybody. Very few uh, large organisations do. But there will still be a place for the, for the office. People will still want to get together. It's just about making sure that Knowing that, as I think I, I tried to illustrate, we've got to try and be a bit braver in terms of how, do, how we're attracting them to our office product and making that a useful experience for them because you're absolutely right. If, it, if they can get everything from their home life, why, why still come? And that's a challenge when you own office buildings. Thank you. And Jay, question for you. The, um, I think you mentioned the return is 5.5, has averaged 5.5. Is that, is that capital and income, or is that, and how's that, how's that broken up, that return? Yeah, yeah. Over 40 years, it actually averaged 6.8, and it was income return, so no capital appreciation. Okay. Total okay. return over that period was 10.1%. 10, 10 Great. So. Thank you. So, unfortunately, we have to leave it there, but I'd like to um, remind you that you can rate this session and provide any feedback via the um, ASI app, and... Um, if you could join with me in thanking our speakers, um, yes, please. <laughs>